Once upon a time, the rivers were to the people as highways are to us now. And throughout the summer, up and down the river, there was a great traffic of people, of hunters going deeper into the forest, of fishermen going down to the great lake for pike, of traders to cross the lake, down to the St. Lawrence, then down to the sea, there to trade for cahog shells of which to make wampum beads. Then one day, traffic from the lakes ceased. Time passed, and those fishermen out for pike failed to return. More time passed, and those traders out for cahog shells, too, failed to return. The people knew what this meant. It was clear that there was a band of enemies somewhere along the river waylaying canoes. The people were outraged, as these were times of peace, and the young men clamored for violence. But the people at large had no desire for war. So instead, a diplomat was sent down the river to resolve whatever grievances the rivals might have against the people. And to his canoe was affixed a staff, and from this staff was hung a wampum belt, so that all he met on his journey would know that he was a diplomat on a mission of peace and not to be attacked under any circumstances. Time passed, and the diplomat too failed to return. And at this, even the most gentle of the people bade for blood. For not even their worst enemy would stoop so low as to attack a diplomat bearing wampum on a mission of peace. The people assembled a war band, two dozen of the finest warriors from all of the neighboring villages, each carrying the finest weapons and armor, a strong bow and a quiver of a hundred arrows. And they sent them down the river in a war canoe. Now a war canoe is different from the canoes we have today. It was as long as a house, as broad as the span of your arms, carved from the trunk of an ancient hardwood tree so thick that no rock could crack it, so thick that no amount of arrows would ever cause it to sink. And two dozen strong men paddling a canoe like this downstream can travel very quickly indeed, and they knew that before the day was out they would reach the lake. Now, at the mouth of the river, where the river meets the lake, it becomes very wide and very slow. But just before this point is a place where the river narrows into rapids, and just before this is a place where the river bends very sharply. And the warriors in the canoe knew this place well. So as they approached, they made ready to deal with the rapids around the corner. And they turned the corner and gasped. And then came the sound of paddles dropping into the water from cold hands. For ahead of them, a giant monster stood straddling the river. Its form was that of a great heron, but warped and twisted by the evil forces that had created it. And a hundred yards or so further downstream was the silhouette of its mate. And some of the men panicked at its sight and tried to steer the canoe towards the shore. But a long canoe like that is difficult to turn in the best of circumstances, and rapids are tricky to navigate. Other men kept their calm. They knew that the only way out of this would be straight through as quickly as possible. And they paddled ahead strong and fast, trying their best to resist the chaos sown by those in panic. Those men who had lost their paddles instead took up their bows and began loosing arrows at the monsters as they approached. As they came close, the monster struck, like a heron, like a spear fisherman. And the man at the front of the canoe, who was calling out the rocks as they approached, was snatched up and eaten. Again and again, the monster struck, snatching up men in its terrible jaws, or else impaling them and dropping them into the river, or else leaving them bleeding in the canoe. And by the time the canoe made it past, a third of the men had been killed or grievously wounded. But there was no rest for the survivors, for the monsters had positioned themselves like spear fishermen, so that any who escaped the first would be carried by the current into the reach of the second. And the remaining warriors lost what composure was left to them and succumbed to the panic, some trying to steer the canoe in a dozen different directions, others still loosing arrows and fumbling, dropping them into the water, others casting themselves overboard to swim to shore, but the swimming men moved slowly in the current and only served to make themselves easier targets for the monsters. And as the dismayed paddlers erratically swerved the boat back and forth, the broadside struck a rock, the boat was flipped, and all the remaining men were pitched into the water. Most tried to swim to shore, but one young man had an idea. He had managed to hold on to the canoe as it went over, and from the water he stuck his head underneath the capsized canoe into a bubble of air. From there, he simply let the current carry him out to the lake. And though the water was cold and the rocks battered his limbs, he held on until he felt the current slow. Then he emerged and swam to shore. Up the river, he could hear the sounds of battle, of shouts, of war songs, and of screaming. He crept stealthily through the forest to see what he could see. On the opposite bank, the last handful of surviving warriors were engaged in battle against the monsters. 
They would shoot arrows, then retreat into the forest, where the trees were too dense for the monsters to follow, then re-emerge when the monster's attention was drawn to someone else. The young warrior yearned to help his kinsmen, but his body was battered from the rocks and his weapons were lost to the river, so he simply stood by and watched, helpless as his friends struggled against the beasts. One by one, the remaining men start to fall, but then, a cry of pain and a cry of triumph, and one of the monsters recoils back with an arrow in its chest. Screaming and in great pain, the beast takes to the air and flees into the forest. The remaining men are hardened and they rush the last monster, seeking to scare it away too, but it holds its ground and slays them quickly. The young man, weeping silently, retreats into the forest, beginning the long, slow journey back home on foot. When he returns to the village and shares his news, there is much wailing and tearing of hair, and all of the remaining men from all of the nearby villages assemble for war, and they set out down the river in a great many canoes. This time, knowing of the trap, the young man has the warband disembark about an hour up the river to cover the rest of the way on foot. From the cover of the forest, the young man spies the two monsters, standing over the river exactly as they had been, their many wounds healed over in the days between. The young man realized that in order to destroy the monsters and make the river safe again, they would have to be prevented from escaping as they had before. He formed a plan. He ordered his warriors to spread out through the forest and surround the monsters. His men were numerous enough that it would be a simple matter to bait the monsters back and forth, as had been done before, but still he needed to prevent them from escaping. So he took a pair of long rawhide ropes, and he tied them to the thickest tree he could find. Then he emerged from the forest and crept up behind the monsters, slowly, slowly. And they were so focused on that corner of the river around which the canoes would emerge that they didn't notice him. And when he got to the monster in the back, he quickly and skillfully tied a knot around its leg. The young man then set his gaze on the second. There would be no sneaking up on the second monster without the first seeing him. So he ran, and he ran, and he ran like he'd never run before, with the first monster pursuing him hot at his heels. And he dove in close, and he struggled to tie that knot as fast and as strong as he could, and just as he got the knot tied, the monster speared him in the chest. And the rest of the warriors, they burst from the trees, shouting and launching arrows. And the monsters moved off to deal with this new threat, but it was too late for the young man, and he died quickly. And in his absence, the warriors carried out his plan, harrying the monsters before retreating into the woods. First one side, then another, then another, then another, and the monsters never knew who to chase. Then the first arrow struck home, and the monsters realized their peril, and they took to the wing and tried to fly off to escape into the forest, but the ropes caught them and brought them to the ground with a crash. Then, before they could pick themselves up, a hundred warriors descended from the woods and chopped them to pieces with axes. When the deed was done, there was much celebration. The warriors praised their courage and skill. They boasted of their personal achievements, arguing over who had actually managed to land an arrow. They laughed and gathered fuel, and with this they built a great bonfire, and onto this fire they threw all of the pieces of the monsters, so as to remove every trace of their existence. But the spirits of the destroyed monsters watched all of this. They looked with disdain upon the hubris of the young men, for having been at the center of it all, they knew that it was not the axes which had been their downfall, but the rope. Not the living warriors who had slain them, but the one young man who lay dead by the river. And the spirits grew angrier and angrier as they watched the young men pour mockery upon their burning remains. And the monster spirits put together every scrap of strength that still remained to them, and they poured it into the ruined pieces of their broken bodies. And as the fire burned beneath the steaming bodies, as the bodies slowly turned to dust, each particle of soot that rose into the air began to change form, becoming like its parents but in miniature. And once enough of them had formed, a cloud of these creatures fell upon the celebrating warriors. They fell upon them without a thought of self-preservation, seeking only to inflict whatever small harm upon them they could. And from that day, the mosquito has plagued us. <laughs>